Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Leveraging Public Health and Healthcare Provider Partnerships to Improve Influenza Immunization Uptake in American Indian Communities in Arizona. On behalf of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials and the Association of American Indian Physicians, we would like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Alyssa Farmer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to go over. As a reminder, to hear the audio for today's webinar, please call 1-866-740-1260 and enter access code 318-5463 when prompted. In addition, to view the slides, please log on using the personalized web link sent to you upon registration for today's webinar. If you need any assistance, please use the raise hand button or the chat box located at the lower left hand side of your webinar screen. Today's webinar will be recorded and it will be available on ASTOS and AEIP's websites. A notification will be sent out when the archived content is available. We welcome your questions. Please submit any questions or comments you may have via your chat window located on the lower, lower left-hand side of the webinar screen and at any time during the presentation. All questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar as time allows. Today's webinar will cover current trends in flu coverage rates, promising influenza practices, activities, and initiatives, as well as highlight resources for healthcare providers and others to improve influenza immunization uptake. We have three featured speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker will be Dr. Karen Lewis. Dr. Lewis is the Medical Director for the Arizona Immunization Program Office at the Arizona Department of Health Services. She received her medical degree from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Lewis is board certified in pediatrics and is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She was board certified in pediatric infectious diseases for 19 years and worked in Phoenix area hospitals as a pediatric infectious disease consultant for 15 years. Following Dr. Lewis, we will hear from Jennifer Tinney. Jennifer Tinney is the program director for the Arizona Partnership for Immunization. Jennifer has been working in immunization education for 14 years and has a background in microbiology and social work. She specializes in provider education programs, vaccine financing, public health billing systems, and partner development. Our final speaker will be Sterling Springer. Sterling Springer joined the AAIP team in December of 2013. He develops and disseminates media communications for national public health projects ranging from print media to video production. Before joining AAIP, Sterling reported for a statewide newspaper covering healthcare policy, education, commerce, and more at the Oklahoma State Capitol. He is a graduate of the University of Central Oklahoma. Sterling serves as a council representative for the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, where he was first elected in 2013. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Lewis. Good morning. I am going to be covering, um, touching just a little bit on national influenza vaccine coverage, um, then going on to Arizona influenza and Arizona vaccine data, and finally focusing in on the information we have on um, Native Americans and influenza vaccine. This shows you the influenza vaccine coverage in the U.S. over several seasons, both early and end of the season, all persons, children, and adults. Um, so for the 2015-2016 series, uh, I'm sorry, season, 45.6% um, of all individuals in the U.S. received influenza vaccine, with the numbers being higher in children. Arizona demographics are that 
as of the census estimate in July 2016, there are close to 7 million people in Arizona. Of those, 5.3% are American Indian or Alaskan Native. Um, measuring the effect of influenza is a bit of a challenge in adults, just the way death certificates are are written. It is estimated there's 700 deaths from influenza every year in Arizona, but we do have specific numbers for pediatric deaths because it's a reportable condition. So we range from one to four deaths a year depending on the severity of the um, of the season. Influenza is coming. It peaks every winter. It's reliably unreliable as to when it starts and when it finishes and how long it lasts. There are three seasons represented here. The 2014 season, um, 2015 to 16 season, when we had the most number of cases identified ever. And the dark blue is this season. We are ratcheting up, um, and we would expect to um, have influenza around for three or more months to come. So even though we immunize back here in the fall, so we can be immunized before influenza season starts, it is never too late to immunize during influenza season because it takes two to three weeks for the immunity to develop. But influenza season can last into April and May. What is currently circulating in Arizona is basically influenza A, a little bit of B. Um, the Arizona State Public Health Laboratory tested influenza subtypes and found that virtually all were influenza A, H3, H3 and 2 is what's also circulating throughout the entire country, very little B. H, um, influenza H3 and 2 historically is associated with um, increased hospitalization and death in the elderly. The Arizona Department of Health Services is involved in influenza vaccine distribution only for the federal vaccine for children program, um, which is vaccine which is provided free of charge for unimmunized children, underimmunized, and for all Native American, Alaska Native children. And so we take orders from and um, allocate vaccine through county health departments, Indian health services, tribal health care centers, and then in areas where these um, the first three resources are um, unable or have a difficulty covering. There are about 27 deputized private providers throughout the state that can also give vaccine for children, vaccines. We, as, um, as the state health department, work to get information out into the community as where you get influenza shots in Arizona, doctors' offices, pharmacies, IHS, tribal health cares, county health departments, um, and there is a national um, online service flu vaccine finder, which actually has been extended to also show you where you can get other vaccines. You just enter your zip code. Um, vaccinefinder.org is the link, but if you just do a search engine and put in flu vaccine finder, you can obtain this. In Arizona specifically, they have an Arizona 211 program 
where you can actually call 211 and individuals in English or Spanish can tell you about community resources, including immunizations. Um, it used to be called community information referral, I believe. Um, or online, the 211arizona.org slash flu will show you where you can get influenza. And they have um, influenza, um, the influenza material can be translated into multiple different languages. Um, you'll hear more about the Arizona Partnership for Immunizations later, um, but at the State Health Department we partner with them in order to get messaging and resources out to the community. We stress immunizing not just everyone. Everyone needs, everyone six months and older needs immunization vaccination, but you have your high risk groups, um, pregnant women, the elderly, Young children, Native American, are at higher risk for complications. I like using this information about how maternal influenza vaccination protects infants because it uses Arizona-specific um, mothers in, in the study and from the Navajo and White Mountain Apache tribes. And Mothers were given influenza vaccine during pregnancy, and the infants who had immunized mothers had 41% less lab-confirmed influenza, 39% lower risk of hospitalization for influenza-like illnesses. Um, pregnant women um, are under-immunized, only about... 50% of um, in the U.S. are immunized. Of interest is if the provider recommends, strongly recommends influenza vaccine and has it at the facility, um, two-thirds of women get immunized if the provider strongly recommends it, but it's not available at the facility and the mother has to go elsewhere. Only a third are immunized, and if the mother, if the provider does not mention it at all, um, less than 10% are immunized. American Indians, and as I mentioned, American Indians and Native Americans are at um, high risk for complications. Um, influenza and pneumonia measure together because, as I mentioned, with the adults we measure influenza and pneumonia deaths. Top 10 cases of death in Native Americans and um, a higher risk of pneumonia hospitalization and death than non-Native Americans. And so it's very important, of course, to have Native Americans immunized against um, against influenza. Dr. Groom and her associates studied the annual death rate from pneumonia and influenza over a 20-year period. This is the graph of um, of their findings. The black line being the American Indians um, and the gray line being um, um, white individuals. And there is a, um, um, a, oh, a skip in the data, and that is because the, the ICD-9 shifted to ICD-10, so the definition of pneumonia and influenza changed, so they graphed it diff um, differently. But as you can see, um, the Native Americans had a higher rate per 100,000 of deaths from pneumonia. And if you look specifically at the death rate from influenza, 
Um, there, it's the difference is not quite as much, except in recent years it has been higher, and especially in 2009. That was the year of the pandemic, and there was four times higher the death rate in Native American than in um, those of um, the white race. So, um, again, just showing the importance of influenza vaccine in Native Americans. This shows the percentage of American Indians based on the, the county, and the dark green is 8% or more of the individuals in a county are Native American. Um, the medium green is 3%, 8%, and then the light green is 1.5%. And as you can see, Arizona, almost all of the counties except um, Cochise and Santa Cruz have an increased percentage of Native Americans. And notice the district. Um, the next slide will show the distribution, or I'm sorry, not the distribution, but the Arizona tribal lands. And as you can see, um, let me get my little pointer here. As you can see, very high concentration um, of Native Americans in the tribal lands in the Northeast, um, Apache tribes the, um, down in the Pima County area, over here in La Paz. And I'm just going to show you in the next slide where our counties are. The reason is it's going to help illustrate um, the role of IHS in delivering influenza vaccine. So the Navajo and Hopi reservations are Apache, Navajo County, Coconino, um, the um, Colorado River tribes are over here in La Paz. And looking for data on Native Americans and influenza vaccination, um, I could not find much data, but I did have, um, the health department did have information from the 2009 um, pandemic influenza when we had vaccine allocations um, and um, looking at, we, we were able to um, identify the facilities at which all of the different vaccines were given. In addition, Native Americans were allocated 10% of the vaccine, even though there were just 5% of the population. Early on, there was um, a great appreciation of the higher um, illness, hospitalization, and death of Native Americans, so they're allocated 10% of the vaccines. And in the 15 country, counties, 11 had less than 10% of the influenza vaccine given by Indian Health Services. But there were four counties, Apache, Navajo, La Paz, and Coconino, that had high percentages of the pandemic vaccine given in that county by Indian Health Services. So Apache was number one. Three quarters of all the influenza vaccine, the pandemic was given um, through IHS, and um, as even higher in terms of the pediatric, demonstrating how important, um, what an important role IHS had in delivering the pandemic influenza. Now there's data that I just found last night, so I didn't have time to make a slide of it, but it was uh, um, Indian Health Services national report for um, how current from the 2015-2016 season, the coverage rate 
IHS coverage rate um, for influenza vaccine, and it was about 35, 36 percent of active clinical population that received the influenza vaccine that year. And broken down by the regions, it was 30% in Phoenix, 40% in Tucson, 43% in Navajo. So lower than the national percentage of 45%. Um, and just important, of course, for Native Americans to get the influenza vaccine. Um, in terms of resources, the CDC has produced um, Native American specific messaging. One is a poster, Life is a Delicate Balance. Another poster, Protect the Circle of Life. Now, these posters can be obtained through the CDC and um, without charge. The um, Circle of Life has been incorporated into a handout that, um, a two-sided handout that goes through what influenza is, why you need to get it, um, but they also have a trifold handout that can um, is available to order and uh, to give to patients. And the same information is provided in the trifold handout. In terms of getting the message out further, um, although we have statewide messaging and IHS is doing a, you know, has good good outreach. Um, here at the State Health Department, we're starting to look into are there ways to work through the IHS public health nurses, community health representatives, and then the tribal health educators to get information out more to the um, grassroots level. Um, and that is my presentation. Um, are there any questions? Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. And just as a reminder, please submit any questions for our presenters via the chat box in the lower left-hand side of the webinar screen. We will be addressing questions at the end of the webinar as time allows. Next, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Tinney. Hi, uh, this is Jennifer Tinney with the Arizona Partnership for Immunization. Uh, we are the statewide nonprofit coalition that partners the public sector and the private sector together on immunization issues as they come up that we need to address in the state. Uh, so just recently, ADHS, along with TAPI, partnered to um, apply for a grant through the CDC that would increase adult immunization rates because we knew we had a problem kind of all across the state and that our rates were low and we were having kind of low uptake. And it's very, very difficult to sometimes interpret the adult immunization schedule and figure out who needs what. So we approached this grant in different ways to look at data and policy and technology and provider education and community messaging to see what we could do to increase those immunization rates for all of Arizona. Because we want to make sure that we have health, happy, healthy families all across the life stages. So we kind of broke those factors down that we know there are patient factors that contribute to it, there are office factors and the workflow and getting immunizations to people, and then there are the systems pieces. So for the first part, we kind of looked at the system to evaluate the data and the policies to see what we could do to increase the recommendations for vaccination for adults. And we looked at the data. And, I, and certainly Dr. Lewis has covered all of that much better than I ever could. So I am going to kind of just skip through these a little bit, but just overall we know adult immunization uptake is much lower than childhood, especially for flu. Uh, we've got very low coverage rates overall for flu and for most adult vaccines. And then when we kind of looked at our IHS facilities, um, some of our areas, 
you know, have a little bit higher than our state average, which would be Navajo and Tucson. And then it looks a little bit lower in Phoenix. And I think that we've kind of determined that some of that has to do with that system level um, piece and sharing data. Uh, we believe that some are getting vaccines, but maybe we just don't know which ones they have. And so we kind of wanted to look at all of those factors. And then um, we kind of pulled off here some of the IHS summaries that have looked at the data on, on immunization coverage levels for adults and specifically for uh, flu as well. Uh, the recommendations are to track the data and to use those reminders. And so as we kind of approach that from that system piece, we wanted to develop some best practices for the use of EHRs, uh, the HIE, the Health Information Exchange, as it kind of rolls in next, and then ACES, which is our statewide immunization, immunization registry that has always tracked childhood doses and then in recent years has expanded into a little bit of the adult doses as well. Because if you ask an adult patient, are you up to date on all of your immunizations? They generally have no idea because the schedule is complex. It changes frequently. Um, one thing that we were hearing from many of our providers when it came to especially things like the pneumococcal vaccine now, they would say, have you had your pneumonia shot? And the patient would say, well, I had one maybe a year ago, maybe less than a year ago, not sure. And so with the recommendation of the two different pneumonia shots that have to be a year apart, um, this is becoming a lot more complex for adult patients to track. So we kind of looked at who has data on this information, who needs it, and how can we maybe share it across the different platforms. So kind of along those lines and about the same time, we got pretty um, fortunate that ACES, our immunization registry, actually turned 18. So from you know, this point going forward, we have some pretty robust data for adults on immunizations they received in childhood. And so they should have some fairly complete records as these kids grew up with the registry. Um, but we also started uh, receiving adult information, adult immunization information from providers several years ago, and most specifically the pharmacies. And we saw kind of a slow uptake with a few doses reported each year and kind of staying stable. But last year we were able to really um, pull in that data, make the connections through the EHRs to get the adult doses reported in. And we're now looking at you know over 2 million adult doses reported this year and last year. And that's really increasing the information that we have on those adult patients and knowing which vaccines that they received. Um, so just to kind of illustrate that a little bit, and especially for um, primary care providers that to understand how much information is in about their adult patients, our pharmacies last year reported uh, 1.6 million doses of influenza, and most likely that hasn't been integrated yet into the um, EHR record of that adult. But if you guys take a little bit of time and go over and and pull that data down from ACES, you may be able to complete those records and make some better recommendations. Uh, we also have a lot of pharmacies reporting uh, giving Tdap to patients as well. Uh, we have large provider groups, which are typically kind of our hospital groups or um, very large clinics that see quite a few patients. They're reporting use of Tdap and then submitting that record to ACES also, and as well as the community health centers. So looking for that very confusing uh, pneumonia shot now and which one patients have received and which ones they need at this point, uh, we do have quite a few of the um, PPC 20, or PPSV 23 doses from pharmacies in the registry, but we also have quite a bit of the Prevnar doses recorded from pharmacies as well. So looking that up will help make that recommendation also. So then uh, as we kind of stepped over into what are the factors that are happening in the offices and the provider offices that are um, impacting that workflow of recommending adult immunizations. Uh, we looked at some education programs that we might be able to do to assist that to see if we can help streamline that process. Uh, so last year we actually had our um, nurse consultant trainer work with the Phoenix Indian Medical Center 
and develop a full and comprehensive set of training slides and materials for adult immunizations. So this goes through the uh, recommendations, uh, tips for talking to patients about adult immunizations and what they may need. It also goes a little bit into kind of storage and handling and the workflow of that and how you make that recommendation and the assessment uh, for what that patient may need. All of these are available. We can share them uh, with different uh, clinics and organizations, and we can also arrange to have a nurse consultant come out and work with the clinic on these and kind of deliver them as needed. Uh, we can do them a little bit over webinars. So anything that you guys need that might help. Um, that, like I said, this was developed with um, Phoenix Indian Medical Center, so it's really kind of based on that um, system and the use of the EHR there, and then pulling in some information from ACES as well. With that training, we have um, a folder of electronic uh, recommendations and, and education and outreach pieces that you guys can use and share and send around that uh, really supports those recommendations and enhances the training as well. During the summers, we, and this is just an example from last year, we actually travel all around the state and do an all-day training that's aimed at the support staff in an office to help them um, answer the questions that patients have, um, answer some questions about vaccine safety and which immunizations that they need, and then it goes through how to use the registry, kind of the technical side of that, um, how to do storage and handling for vaccines and to work with the VFC program and the requirements that are there, and then other resources that are available in the communities. So we do go out around the state. Uh, we do approximately 10 per year, and so we try to hit every different area. We'll have the registration for the 2017 trainings up in about six weeks. So if you just uh, follow our website at tappy.org, you can sign up there and register for that. And then, like I said, it's really aimed at the support staff in a clinic that really does the day-to-day hands-on management of the vaccine programs within the clinics. We also have quite a bit of community messaging to increase adult immunizations. And our hope is that as we tackle this from a system side that we can get messaging out to the community about uh, what is recommended for them so that they get the same message from their physician, from the office support staff, from their health plan perhaps, and the health department and the messages that they're using in the community, that we're all using that consistent message over and over again. So uh, for the last year, we've been developing different messages and materials for different organizations and audiences, and we have quite a few examples that we can uh, send out to everyone. You all can order them from us. We've got some flu-specific messaging. I got my flu vaccine to protect my daughter. We got our flu vaccine to protect our grandmother. I got mine to protect my patient. We also have the uh, family messaging about the importance of having a, a healthy and well-immunized family to protect each other. We uh, produce web banners and kind of click buttons and postcards, whatever could be used in your clinic that you need, we can help develop or share with you what we have. This campaign specifically, as an example, was developed with the Hospital Acquired Infection Committee at ADHS. And this is really for healthcare workers and long-term care centers in NICUs and in hospitals. And they wanted a message for their peers, for healthcare providers, as a reminder that they need to get there immunizations up to date to protect their patients. And so they had chosen some images that represented the types of patients that they work with on a day-to-day -day basis as a reminder that we care and protect people, but we also need to protect them by making sure that we are healthy and well and that we're not sharing um, flu with them each year. So with that, we have a, a provider flu button up campaign that we call, and each year, we um, send out a postcard with a button, so when you get your flu shot, you can add that button to your lanyard as a way to start that discussion with your patient and to let your patients know that you are up to date and that you're protecting them with your immunizations as well. 
Uh, this is a flyer that we recently developed. It's targeted specifically to adults. It answers questions about the registry and about keeping track of immunization records. And then on the back side of it, it goes through the different age groups and the recommended vaccines for those ages. So it starts at 19 to 20. It goes through 50 to 64, over 65, and then the bottom section, which is hidden a little bit there, is the immunization schedule and recommendations for healthcare providers. So we can keep um, reminding each other that we all need to have our flu vaccine to promote herd immunity. Uh, we have some messages that are family focused. So it starts in childhood and goes through adulthood. We want to make sure that everyone knows that immunizations are across the lifespan and that we, they grow with us. As we grow, so does our immunization schedule. And then we just kind of come up with different ways for different audiences to get that message out there. Uh, this one is a little bit of a, kind of a fun cartoon uh, character one that we have a lot of families pick up at um, health fairs and things like that. And it does go through what every uh, member of the family needs to stay up to date on their immunizations. We also have a growth chart that is uh, for pregnant moms. And it's a growing a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby growing up. And on uh, the one side, it goes through all the tips for a healthy pregnancy, starting with a flu and Tdap recommendation. <laughs> excuse me, during pregnancy, so that you are sharing immunity with the baby. And then the other side of it is a healthy baby growing up, and each immunization that they need as they grow and hit those developmental milestones. Uh, we have those available as well. Uh, they have some scan codes on them that send patients to information on things like WIC and car seat safety and wearing helmets and back to sleep. Uh, so it's really kind of that whole baby perspective. Uh, this is an example of our uh, Protestus campaign, which is surround your loved ones with a vaccinated family. And then it, this is an example of how we've been able to uh, adapt that message that's the same surround your baby with a vaccinated family to a more targeted audience. So Protect the Circle of Life is actually an adaptation of the first uh, flyer that was used in Utah with, at one of their IHS facilities. So we can target uh, the message specifically. We can uh, change it to your organization. We can add your logo to it. We can share the artwork, whatever you all need to kind of help keep that discussion going with your patients. We are happy, happy to help with that. Um, so we're ho we hope that with all of these together, uh, we're looking at patient factors and office factors and systems that we can start to see the adult immunization coverage levels uh, rise because we know that working together on that data-driven, coordinated approach and targeting the EHR reminders, connecting those EHRs to ACEs, and then we're also doing some um, trials right now on connecting ACEs into the HIE as more and more EHRs are sharing data that way. We want to make sure that you all have all of the information that you need to keep your patient up to date and make an appropriate recommendation for immunization. And then also, you know, always keeping up with that immunization schedule is a tough job. It is a specialty area because that, that schedule is complex and it changes frequently. So anything that we can do to do ongoing, continued education um, on that area, we, we certainly would uh, be more than healthy, happy to work with you guys on developing something very particular that you need. And I think that, you know, that kind of is an overview of everything we're working on on that. But I'm certainly able to answer questions at the end of this, or you can email me at any time to um, uh, get more of the resources that we have or anything, or suggestions would be great on anything that you need that will help you um, tackle this tough, tough, complex system. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And finally, I'd like to introduce Sterling Springer. Thank you, Alyssa, and thank you, Dr. Lewis and uh, Jennifer, for the presentations earlier. Um, I'm just going to kind of touch on some uh, additional influenza immunization resources for uh, American Indian and Alaska Native populations. Um, the mission statement here at uh, AEIP 
um, is to pursue excellence in the Native American health care by promoting educational and medical disciplines, uh, by honoring and tra traditional healing practices, and restoring the balance of uh, mind, body, and spirit. Um, and so making sure that uh, Native people are healthy and getting their flu vaccinations is, uh, is an important part of that mission. Um, I just kind of wanted to touch on the IHS, uh, that Healthy People 2020 goal, and um, kind of show what the active clinic users are, uh, what the goal is for the IHS has. 70% uh, of um, immunization coverage for active clinic users. Uh, right now they're about uh, mid-30s um, on any given year. Uh, we would love to see that go up, obviously. Um, just kind of some interesting things. So I would be considered a, a, uh, an active user in the IHS system, but when I get my influenza vaccination, I'll get it through a Walgreens or through my private insurance. Um, so I imagine that those numbers on influenza are a little higher for the vaccinations, uh, thanks to people like myself. But um, here's also the healthcare provider for IHS uh, among the ITU facilities, and this is all the facilities. Um, again, the, the, the 2020, the healthy um, goal, 2020 goal, uh, is at 90%. Um, so a few more years to, to get it up uh, to around the 90%, um, which I think is very doable. And here you've got the healthcare provider uh, broken down by IHS and tribal sites. This is due partially to the fact that IHS has a different um, vaccination policy than some of the tribal clinics do. Uh, so that is one way to increase, increase your healthcare provider vaccination coverage is by adding those uh, policies into tribal, um, into tribal policies for tribal facilities. So as I was putting the presentation together, um, IHS does a, a really good job of um, keeping track of how many dosages uh, go out. So IHS um, to date, and this was as of the middle of uh, January, uh, has administered um, 293,000 doses of the influenza vaccination, um, and that was from about July 2000, uh, the beginning of the flu season last year uh, at July to the current date. Uh, and so they, they break down uh, populations, uh, dosages, uh, percentage-wise, the largest users um, in the IHS system or the largest population is at 18 to uh, 49. Um, adult range there, um, and inside of the uh, epidemiology um, data that they've got, it's one of the lower uh, rates of people that are that are immunized as far as um, users in the uh, in the facility. And for people who aren't aware of uh, where to find that information, uh, it's updated on a about a weekly basis, um, and I'll have that here after this next slide. But kind of some of the things that AEIP has done uh, as far as community outreach um, for va vaccinations and also screenings is we found uh, that radio PSAs specifically geared towards tribal communities um, work well. So there's uh, a radio, uh, radio company that we've used in the past that is specifically, specifically geared towards tribal communities, and that's Native Media. So they put on uh, productions like Native American Calling and Native News, um, and those air in uh, a lot of different markets that are uh, high American Indian, Alaska Native populations. And we've had good rates with those. Um, print media, uh, brochures and posters, uh, the Arizona State Health Department, IHS, uh, TAPI, and AIP and, and other um, organizations have a ton of media that uh, is available. Um, we've got some DVDs with waiting room videos uh, and on our website as well that are uh, high quality print ready so you can download them on our website um, and print them in house uh, or you can send us a message and um, we can send those out to you as well. Uh, policies, mandatory influenza vaccinations for healthcare professionals is another good way to um, increase those uh, vaccination rates uh, and tribal tribal facilities. We've also found that having a flu champion at your facility, uh, somebody who goes around and is, is kind of constantly promoting uh, the flu vaccination and other vaccinations uh, helps to increase those numbers at those specific facilities. 
Um, and then utilizing existing resources, uh, like I said, through TAPI and IHS and AEIP and the Arizona State Health Department and other organizations uh, that have uh, influenza uh, information. So here are some um, uh, additional resources websites that IHS uh, has. So the surveillance reports, like I said, are updated on a, on a near weekly basis. Um, then there's educational materials um, there at the IHS site as well. Uh, and then AEIP has the uh, influenza um, videos. So we've produced um, five videos that kind of co cover a circle of life as well as some posters and brochures so here's our poster right there. It's an 18 by 24 uh, poster that goes up in your um, in your waiting rooms. Um, here's our brochure. It's just kind of an informational pamphlet for uh, for patients uh, while they're waiting in the waiting room. And then additionally, so most facilities that we've found, IHS and tribal facilities, uh, have TVs in the waiting rooms. So we developed five uh, waiting room videos that are about a minute apiece. Uh, that kind of covers the circle of life. So we've got a, a pregnant mother, uh, we've got an infant, uh, we've got an, a, a teen, which isn't listed on here, um, video, uh, an adult uh, immunization video, and then an elder immunization video as well. And these uh, just play on loops um, at the facility in the, uh, in the waiting rooms. And like I said, those are on our website. Uh, they're also on the IHS website. Uh, but you can download them directly from the AIP website uh, for use in a digital form, or you can contact us and we will uh, send one out to your facility. Here's our contact information, my email, the office number, uh, and then our address here in uh, Oklahoma City along with our website. Thank you, Sterling. And thanks again to Dr. Lewis and Jennifer Tinney for sharing your knowledge and information on useful resources for improving influenza immunization uptake. We now have some time for some questions. If you would like to submit a question for any of the presenters, please do so now by chatting in your question via the chat box on the lower left-hand side of your screen. Our first question is for Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis, can you tell us what the level of participation is in your ILI surveillance is from IHS tribal clinics? No, we do not um, follow the, um, the surveillance by tribal clinics. Thank you. This question is for all presenters. What successes do you know about for media outreach in Alaska? Uh, this is Karen Lewis. Um, I only know of one, but on the CDC website that had the other posters, there was a wonderful um, Circle of Love poster with a grandfather looking at his son. And it's a Keep Alaska Healthy. And this is Jennifer. I believe there's a very active immunization coalition in in Alaska that is trying to do quite a bit of grassroots work on messaging um, in the community. And I can I'll see if I can look up the contact for there, and maybe we can share it uh, later with the slides. Thank you. Our next question is for all presenters. Do all retail pharmacies send information to ASIIS on administered vaccines if not provided by the state? This is Karen Lewis. The law says that all pharmacies that give vaccines must report administration of that vaccine ACEs, whether it's a child or an adult. Um, if it's not a pharmacy, the law only requires that um, children vaccine be reported, although adult vaccine reporting is optional. Thank you. Our next question is for all presenters. 
Could you explain your take on high-dose flu vaccines? Um, this is Karen Lewis, if I understand the question, is whether high-dose flu vaccine is um, recommended or preferable. Um, the CDC has not made a recommendation, a preference, for either the high-dose versus the quadrivalent. Now, the, there are two high-dose um, vaccines available, one that has four times the amount of antigen and the other that has an adjuvant. Both are only trivalent versus the quadrivalent. However, um, I have heard some discussion that the elderly are most severely affected by the H3N2 virus, and therefore um, some practitioners prefer to use the high dose for their elderly patients um, until there can be a quadrivalent high dose vaccine. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question is for all presenters. How can healthcare providers get more involved in influenza immunization uptake efforts? Uh, this is Jennifer with, with Kathy, and, and certainly you all are uh, welcome to sign on to any of our uh, committee meetings we meet for community awareness and provider education programs. Uh, monthly and every other month to develop a more specific and, and usable information for healthcare providers. Uh, we also do quite a bit on, you know, kind of our mailing list to keep people up to date on anything that new that comes out. We share Dr. Lewis's vaccine news when she puts that out, as well as resources from the CDC. Uh, so if anybody wants to just send me an email, I'll make sure to get you on our contact list so that you can get the most up-to-date information that we have. This is Karen Lewis. The most influential step a provider can take with his patients is to make a strong recommendation for the vaccine. And so that can be done on an individual basis every day. Wonderful, thank you. Our next comment is from a participant. We just want to also remind people that the video PSA for American Indian Alaska Native communities that Sterling uh, mentioned on adult vaccinations can be found online and we will be uh, sending everybody the link in just a second. But if anyone is interested in airing this free video PSA, please contact Amy Groom with IHS and her email is amy.groom at ihs.gov. Our next question for the presenters is what are some strategies for healthcare providers and other food champions to help promote flu vaccines in their communities? This is Sterling. I think uh, kind of going off what Dr. Lewis said is just making sure, and that's one of the things we do at AIP is um, remind our members to offer the flu vaccination um, and because, like she said, that is the best way. Um, if you've got a, a strong suggestion uh, from your health care provider, um, you're more likely to get the uh, influenza vaccination or another vaccination um, with that strong suggestion. Um, this is Karen Lewis. Having information for the patients as to where to get the influenza vaccine, optimally in your office, if not in your office, make it easy for them to figure out where to find a vaccine, whether to um, um, the flu vaccine finder online, whether the Arizona 211 phone call, um, county health departments are a wonderful source 
of either vaccines for the un um for sometimes even for the insured um if because they they can some county health departments bill for vaccines or they can tell you where vaccines are being given um people who find too many barriers just say oh well it's not that important and this is Jennifer. I would also recommend doing a reminder campaign with all of your patients, whether it's sending an old-fashioned postcard or uh, if you've got a text message system or an email system, but sending those reminders that it's important for the whole family to be up to date on all of their immunizations works is actually one of the number one ways that you can get patients caught up pretty quickly and get information forward in the community. Wonderful, thank you. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters one more time and to thank participants for chatting in your questions. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for answering your inquiries today. Um, just a reminder, a recording of today's webinar will be available on ASTOS and AAIP's websites shortly. And we will also be sending out a PDF of all webinar slides via email after this conference ends. Finally, we'd appreciate if you took a few moments to complete a quick webinar evaluation. The link to the evaluation will be sent to you via email shortly. Your responses will help guide future efforts to disseminate and improve work in this area and to improve future webinars. We would like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar, and we hope you all have a great day. Thank you.